the popular song The Year I Entered Middle School was Angry Girl Alanis Morissette's rock ballad, Ironic. And in it, she lays out the kind of life situations that are deliberately contrary to what one expects. A traffic jam when you're already late. Rain on your wedding day. A free ride that you've already paid. Good advice you just didn't take. What makes her angry as she highlights these ironies is that things aren't the way they're supposed to be. She asks, isn't it ironic, don't you think? I wonder what Jesus' followers thought when they heard Jesus' bald statement, I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. Or his rhetorical question and response, do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. Or as Matthew's gospel puts it, not peace, but a sword. I'm sure that Jesus' followers, expecting to meet the gentle, compassionate healer or the sage rabbi, were taken aback by the deliberately contrary radical who confronts them with the cost of discipleship. This Jesus seems out of character with the Jesus we typically expect. Far from being the sweet, cuddly baby in the manger, today we see a glimpse of the radical dissident lurking under the surface of the self-possessed young man. This Jesus sounds more in line with Che Guevara than with Gandhi. Mm -hmm. I have come not to bring peace, but division. His comment stands in stark contrast to the beginning of Luke's Gospel, where Jesus promises to guide our feet into the way of peace. In stark contrast to the end of the Gospel, where the resurrected Jesus offers the benediction peace be with you, in stark contrast to the greetings of peace given to the sick whom he healed. Is Jesus being ironic, do you think? This text is challenging. What kind of Messiah promises familial disruption? Where is the good news of God to be found in such radical pronouncements of strife and dysfunction? What kind of savior promises division rather than peace? How do we reconcile this Jesus of judgment and accusation with the Jesus who promises reconciliation and redemption? It may be helpful to remember that Jesus' ministry makes a pivotal turn in Luke 9.51 when he sets his face toward Jerusalem. Two, the verses just prior to this text teach the disciples to be alert and prepared for Jesus' future coming. Now the text pivots to address the effect that Jesus' mission will have on human relationships and human expectations. Jesus says, I come to bring fire to the earth. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and how constrained I am until it is completed. Jesus sets a drastic tone for the advent of his mission and declares his total engagement in that mission. He sets his face toward accomplishing God's plan of salvation through his death and resurrection. Suffering is the baptism in which Jesus will be baptized. The fire he brings will be the often hostile response to the claim that God died on the cross for the sins of the world. Jesus announces that he is compelled to accomplish his mission, compelled and unwavering until it is finished. He sets his face toward Jerusalem. He admonishes his followers to interpret the present time in light of what will come, his resurrection. He reminds them to be vigilant, waiting in watchful expectation for his future return. They will be the ones who spread the message of God's salvation to all the ends of the earth. Such intensity and singularity of purpose is rare. This resolute, single-minded, gritty Jesus is difficult to relate to. 
The division that Jesus proclaims indicates the reality of what his death and resurrection will accomplish. The Lucan theme is radical reversal of our norms. In Jesus' world, as in political rhetoric today, the household is the core institution of society. Peace in the household reflects peace in society. Jesus' comment to bring not peace but division, along with his illustration of that division in household terms, claims that the very bedrock of society will be shaken by his mission. The status quo of life and relationship will be rent asunder. No longer will family ties bind together. Rather, one's very identity will be bound by belief in only one thing, the blood of Christ shed for salvation. Acceptance or rejection of Jesus will be the only identifying factor in the reign of God. God's kingdom breaks into the present moment in a surprising reversal of all that has been known. The irony is that Jesus denies bringing peace even as his mission is designed to bring the ultimate peace of God to fruition. Divine peace is established in the reordering of relationships, relationships that become defined by mercy, justice, compassion, and the love of God. Indeed, Jesus' entire life's work is about restructuring relationships, seeing each other with the eyes of God rather than through the normal human status quo, a radical reversal. Jesus did not come to proclaim good news to comfortable religious, political, or economic institutions. Rather, the opposite. He excoriates the lack of compassion and love shown by the Pharisees, rebuked Caesar's claim to divinity and absolute rule, threw over the tables of the merchants in the temple. Jesus proclaimed, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus ate with tax collectors and prostitutes, touched lepers and hemorrhaging women, healed dying servants of Roman centurions, named a Samaritan the example of love, and generally fellowshiped with those deemed unclean outsiders. Jesus came not to the religious institution, and not to a comfortable family of insiders, but to expand the definition of membership in God's kingdom. This Jesus disrupts the natural order. This Jesus would put the first last, and the last first, a radical reversal. Jesus has no patience for those of us who do not comprehend the urgency of his mission. This gospel defies our notions of gentle Jesus, meek and mild. If we are invested in maintaining the status quo, then this gospel defiantly challenges our comfort and our complacency. Not everyone welcomes God's plan for peace, especially when God's radical reversal threatens our own power and privilege and control. This Jesus utterly demolishes our traditional understanding of how we are to be in relationship to each other. Even as he flings open the door to a radical relationship between God and humanity, a relationship redefined by grace and mercy. Isn't it ironic that we must be willing to suffer the pain of the cross before we get to resurrection. Isn't it ironic that we can interpret the weather but can't figure out how to live what Jesus preaches? Isn't it ironic that the Prince of Peace is the one who highlights our divisions? If we are to love as Jesus loves, we must give up everything we think we know, 
all our comfortable notions about how God works, everything we hold dear for the sake of the cross. That's the way things are supposed to be, but rarely are. Isn't it ironic, don't you think?